I've really been looking forward to this interview because it's an inspirational story and what we love to hear from on the radio station is people who are out and about inspiring other people but also they're sharing their journey and a lot of people from that can get encouraged which is exactly why I'd like to bring on Anthony and Sarah from holyscript.co.uk. Hi to you both. Hi. Hi. So tell us, um, you got married fairly recently, didn't you? It was 2022. What took so long? Yes, Anthony, what did take so long? <laughs> Come on, Anthony. Uh, I think it's, we got engaged. Um, it was the day before lockdown happened. Right, okay. Uh, so <laughs> everything was cancelled and shut. Uh, so it was like, okay, we can only plan, plan a wedding. Um, so it took... That's why it took so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us about how you first met. Do you want to <laughs> go with that one? Um, <laughs> I sense here that this could shop. potentially be... my hair Sorry? Okay. No, so um, I was about to say that from yeah. you looking at each other like that, it was either yeah. going to be an awkward story or something yeah. that you don't really want to share, but I've asked it, so you'll probably have to share. <laughs> well, I don't mind sharing. So I took my two youngest boys to our local barber shop to get the hair cut, and Anthony was in there, so he was friends with the owner. Um <laughs> And then uh, after I left the shop, I got a friend request on Facebook from Anthony. Um, and then he sent me a, a message and it just went from there. <laughs> so literally by the time you got home, he'd sent you a friend request? Yes. He wasn't messing around, was he? No, he wasn't. I knew what I, knew what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I have to ask, how did he manage to get your name in order to send a friend request? So the lady who owned the barber shop is also was a close friend of mine as well. Okay. Um, so we was talking, and I just recently separated from the boy's dad. Um, so she was talking about that, and then I'm guessing Anthony must have asked her my full name because he got my first name from so talking to to the lady. And then yeah, so I'm guessing he he went Facebook searching. <laughs> and. How much of an impact did the size of his arms have on you saying yes to going out on a date? It was more the legs. His calves are massive. Are they really? Now, if yes. it wasn't such a small screen, I would ask him to show us his calves right now so everybody watching can see them. But we won't go there. And uh, we'll just say that clearly you must work out about eight times a week. Is that fair to say? <laughs> no, I rest on a Sunday. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so we've got a real, real um, interesting story that you'd like to share. And what I want to say is that it takes a lot for somebody to come on a radio station and to open up their heart. But you're doing this because you want to encourage other people and you want to offer them hope. So I want to ask you the question, Sarah. Tell us about yep. your sister, Katie. What was she like? Oh, she was your typical uh, big sister. So she's the eldest and the middle one. And then this my little sister, Jenny. Um, but yes, yeah, she was your typical big sister. Growing up, bossing you around, stressing at you because you're borrowing a clothes and a makeup, but then she was your your role model and always wanted to follow in a footsteps. She was being outside, didn't she? Oh yeah, yeah, she was an exploring. outdoor kind of gal. <laughs> yeah. And let's go back to April 2022. Yep. When you found out that your sister Katie had gone missing, what did that feel yes. like? Um, it didn't feel real. Uh, my little sister sent me a message saying Katie's gone missing, and I was like, "What? Are you joking?" Um, and then she rung me, and when she was telling me uh, the situation that had gone on, it was on loudspeaker, and Anthony was sat on the sofa listening to Man and Jenny's conversation, um, and he was like, "This, this doesn't seem right. There's something not right here." Um, the story that my sister got told from Katie's abuser, um, an ex-partner. Um, it, it, nothing, it, nothing made sense. Um, she Apparently she dropped her keys off and a bank card off 
through his door at half nine in the morning and she's gone to some wellness retreat. But yet her car was still outside of his house, which my sister saw. So she went round and knocked on um, and everything with all Katie's belongings were there, but there was no Katie. So then she got in touch with us and then Anthony was like, something doesn't, this doesn't sit right. This is not, something's wrong here. Um, and then we got in the car and we drove, drove down to his house, didn't we? <laughs> and this was at what, six o'clock at night? Yeah, six, seven o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've banged on the door um, and he's come to the door and he was like, where's my sister? Where's the things? Why are you not giving us the belongings? Um, and it got a little bit heated between Anthony and um, his name's Andrew. Got a bit heated between them two. Um, and it got to the point where he called the police on us <laughs> because uh, apparently we was a domestic towards him. When the police turned up, um, I explained the whole situation. They went in, they questioned Andrew, and within 10 minutes they came out, didn't they? And yeah. they said, we need to go and search his sister's house for putting her down as a missing person. I was like, right, this is real now. This, they, they, the police have clearly picked up on something. So, it, yeah, it went from there. Was there part of you that thought, I'm sure there's a simple explanation to this. Now, you did say that it was out of character for Katie, but yes. was there maybe part of you that was thinking, I'm sure she's just been held up somewhere and she'll walk through that door sometime soon? Yeah, my, and I think I thought the same as my little sister. Um, we both thought, oh, she's probably at a friend's house because we know how much stress and abuse she went through with Andrew. And we thought she's probably just gone through her friends, having a bit of a break. But she wouldn't leave her children like that and she wouldn't send so the children got messages from Katie's phone saying that she's gone away, you've got to go to your dad's, um, Andrew will be there if you if you need any backup or any help. Um, and we just we knew that wasn't right. That Katie would never do that. If she was going to go to a wellness retreat or go away for the weekend, she'd get one of us to babysit and look after the children. Um, so, yeah, we, we just... It was, yeah, it just worked right. <laughs> and then eventually, of course, you heard, I can't even imagine what that would have felt like, that your sister had been killed and they'd found her body. It seems a strange question to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What did that yeah. feel like to receive that news? <laughs> Numbing, I'd say, it's just... I think because when we got told We'd that he had harmed her, we still didn't know where she was. So I think we got told we're at the Wednesday. She went missing on the Friday and we found her on the Friday, didn't we? The Friday after, <coughs> yeah. So, so it was, it was still week not knowing. full week of not knowing where she were, but then in the middle we got told he had harmed her and she was no longer with us. So, yeah, it was like numbing. Yet, yeah. I don't know, I can't come up with a word. It was just, it was just the most heartbreaking experience to ever go through and be yeah. told that she's not no longer with us but we still don't know where she is and the grieving process i don't think i don't think some of us have even started grieving the doing the grieving process properly yet either no. um which is what the professionals told us we expected to members of the family to have counseling straight away and their advice is you don't need counseling yet because it's not even hit you you've not kind of processed all the information yet so mm. counseling comes very and they were right at the time you didn't think that they were they were right and that you needed it but we now know going further down the line that it definitely needed to wait mm. so i guess there was this strange feeling of you said that you were numb and then you're waiting for i guess the grief to properly hit you is that how it was yes yeah and the man who did this was her ex-partner. What yeah. did you feel towards him at the time? <laughs> I'm watching my language now. Um, a lot of hate. Um, I wanted to, I think all of us did, didn't we? we wanted to go to, to the prison where he was at and have a few <laughs> stern words with him. Um, yeah, we hated him, absolutely hated him. And we, I think we still do. <laughs> because I guess when you lose somebody, a loved one, regardless of the circumstances, 
it is an awful thing. But when you yeah. lose somebody in those sort of circumstances, it must literally be hell on earth. Yeah, yeah. I say we don't. We, we didn't lose her. She was stolen. She was stolen from us at the hands of him. Yeah. And do you think you'll ever forgive him? I think that's the journey I'm on at the minute with finding faith. Um, it's it's helped me out massively going through the journey and the process of losing Katie. Um, and there is them questions that when we go to church and we hear the preachers of forgiveness, I sit there and I think, I don't think I could do that yet. Mm. I'm not ready. Um, I forgive for myself at this moment in time, so I'm not hurt and stressed about him. But I don't think I'm ready to forgive him for what he's done. And I guess that takes time. And yeah. nobody would ever suggest that it's an easy thing to do. No. But I'm so glad that when I hear this, that I can tell that you get in there in a sense, you're in your faith, you've found God, which is what we'll move on to now, actually, because mm -hmm. understandably, that kind of trauma is something that lasts for a long time. But it's how you deal with it. And yeah. I want to move to you, Anthony, because during all this, yeah. Something encourage you to go to church. Tell us about how this happened. So, as well as losing Katie, we also then, within the immediate family, that we then had other mental health issues uh, and battles. We had suicide attempts, self-harming attempts. Um, and me as a dad, um, didn't know how to deal with it. And I had private times probably driving around in the car etc where I had broken down questioning how we help the family how do we get through it all um googling things trying to work things out and all the rest of it and then it was just one day and I don't know if I'd been I mean my grandparents went to life before it was life church they went to Queensgate and then it moved to life church um so I don't know if it was in the back of my mind because of my grandparents or if I'd seen some of it on social media. But I was just driving along one day and I just had this thought. I was like, Life Church, if we all go to Life Church, it's got everything there for us that we need and it might just kind of help us. So I rung Sarah and I said, we're going to Life Church on Sunday. And she went, all right, okay. And we turned up and we've not really missed that. We, we, we obviously we went to church on the Sunday and then we actually got married on the Saturday afterwards. And then we went on a honeymoon, so we missed three weeks. We missed three weeks, but we were watched, watched it on the live stream, sat around the pool. <laughs> In Bali. Now that is dedication. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was, it was, the, for us, it was the best thing we've done as a couple yeah. and for as a family. Um, just the help and the support and the faith. Um, it's just kind of concreted it all together, really. And... Did that offer you the peace that maybe you'd been searching for for a long time? Yeah, I yeah. would say so. Yeah. So I started, uh, when did I start the counselling? I actually started counselling right at the beginning of this year. Um, and I had four sessions and it just, I, it just didn't feel right. No, it must it was, have been just before we started because you'd had somebody. Yeah. Oh no, it might be. Anyway. Yeah, it was beginning of this year. Um, and it just didn't feel right. I don't know if it was because it were over Zoom and I had to sit in my bedroom and do it. It just, I wasn't comfortable, so I stopped it. And I now say that going to church is like my counselling sessions. Every week we went, every answer, every questions we had got answered through. It was, Fear. yeah, it was funny, weren't it? The first week we went, they we started a new te teaching series at church and it was all about wisdom. Um, and we sat there and we kept on looking at each other and, and we grinning and we nudged each other like, like, we needed this. <laughs> we needed to listen to this. This is exactly what we need. But then every week we were looking at each other going, well, we needed to hear that this week. Mm -hmm. To the point where we questioned whether the church leaders had a microphone in our, our living room listening <laughs> to what we needed to hear. But I suppose that's God, isn't it? God, God's listening to what we need and he kind of passes that on to be to somebody else. Yeah. So I guess God is that microphone, isn't it? Um, but because... yeah, it was... It's, there can't be many counsellors 
around the world who would know how to, I guess, counsel somebody who's been through what you've been through. But yeah. the grand counsellor, shall we call him, is God. <laughs> yeah. And he knows exactly yeah. what your heart needs to hear yeah. and how to, yeah. I guess, minister peace to your broken hearts. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's the... It's not locking... I mean, it, the fact that we lost Katie is tragic, but it's we can't keep looking at the negatives. We need to keep moving forward and the positives. So the fact that we can be open and talk about it and share a story to try and help. So that's what we've now got to do. Um, yeah, and it's, it's making new out of the old. Into, yes, this bad happened, but what can we do with that bad to make good? Something, to make good? And that's that's where his message is trying to go, really. is um, And that's... And it's only through going to church and faith that we've kind of been given that ideology real. So fairly new Christians, but you haven't let that hold you back. You're going around the country, going to other churches and sharing your testimony and your journey. And you've also started a Christian clothing brand. Tell us about that. So Holy Script, um, that came about when we... We joined, we joined a live group through church um, and there was a Talking Jesus course and it's about talking about Jesus. And there was one um, session where it mentioned about people, non-Christians and Christians not able to talk or they get scared about talking about Christian, Christianity and faith. It was like, well, how, do you, how can we come about people communicating without just staying it straight up and then getting negative feedback and I thought t-shirts putting scripture on t-shirts will get people talking in a positive way hmm. and then we came up with holy script didn't we <laughs> and what does the future hold for you two so it's interesting isn't it how and I find this with a lot of the guests who we speak to how something mm -hmm. so awful can gradually be turned into something positive. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that the death of your sister is something that you'll ever look back on and think, thank goodness that happened. Of course yeah. not. But <laughs> God can always show light in even the darkest of times. And just in this short time already, a lot has happened to you both. You've got married. You started this fashion brand. So where do you think you'll be in five years, what will be happening for you as a family? I, I think as the, the see, we, we started it as a Christian clothing brand um, and getting the message. But then as as we talk to more people like yourselves um, and kind of keep talking about the idea, we're not, we don't see it as a clothing brand. We see it as a family with a story and we've got a mission to try and help other people. And the, the clothing helps us kind of get that message across. One, we get to spread the message. So every time somebody wears a T-shirt, it starts a conversation. And when that person then starts that conversation, they say, well, it was this family that went through this. And it keeps the conversation of domestic violence and fear. It keeps it moving. But also the sale of the T-shirts then also helps us fund to keep doing what we want to do and keep the story moving forward as well. So that's kind of where we see it going in the future really is that we can just mm. keep it talking and if it can help one person and i mean we've already got messages coming through from people saying that they've escaped um domestic violence relationships and what we're doing is fantastic and to keep doing what we're doing um and there was one lady that did a testimony at church last week she made me cry mm. um and when i went when she finished, I said, it was absolutely beautiful what, what you said. And she said, well, I've got to thank you, she says, because it's your testimony and your story that made me able to speak up and talk about my story as well. She said, so if it wasn't for you and Sarah, I'd have never been able to share my story either. So the, it's it's already working and I can only see it hopefully getting better and better um, and making more people open up to talk about the problems as well. So it's almost becoming a bit of a movement, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think Katie would say if she saw you now and she could come back 
for five minutes. What do you think she'd think about this and your whole journey? I'm trying to think. She, she was quite comical, so she even what we call banter. She'd probably make <laughs> up a a bit of banter, or she'd be really, really, really emotional and proud. I think, yeah, but I mean, there was before we lost Katie. There was a conversation that she had with Sarah's mum that was she kept on going back to Andy because she wanted to try and fix him. And she didn't want him to hurt any other women. He didn't, she didn't want him to do what he'd he done to her. To anybody else. She wanted to try and fix him and stop it so it didn't happen to anybody else. And unfortunately, in doing that, that she's, it's cost her a life. Um, so I think the fact that Katie can now see that we're now trying to put the message across and help people spot the signs of somebody who is being abused, etc., to stop that from happening. And if we can stop one person, then I'm sure Kate will be up there and say, you've done your job, guys. <laughs> um, and that's that's kind of where we keep, keep going real. Yeah. So you can read more about the story. You can support these guys. You can go and have a look at the merchandise and the clothing they've got. Or maybe if you've heard this and you're thinking, actually, I need to get some advice. I need somebody to talk to. Then go to the website, holyscript.co.uk. And I just want to thank you both for being so open about Katie and about your journey and your struggles, because there'll be people hearing this and people watching it who will certainly be inspired and encouraged by what you've said. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.